to show you how to safely ferment so you don't kill your family. To some that might sound like clickbait, but I talk to a lot of people and that is the number one reason why they won't start fermenting. That and I tried to make pickles once and it sucked. Please don't start with pickles. It requires a special set of skills even Napoleon Dynamite would be jealous of. But anyways, decades of fear mongering and misinformation have led people to believe they can give themselves botulism if they screw up. But that couldn't be further from the truth and today I'm going to teach you everything you never knew you needed to know so that you can know you won't escort anyone in your family to the afterlife. I am not a nutritionist or a scientist. I'm just a geek with Google and I love to share what I learned. These videos are for inspiration, education, and laughs only. Certainly not for medical advice, so do your own research, talk to your doctor, all of the things. Today we're kicking off fermented February. More on that in just a minute. So I thought it seemed appropriate to start with the basics. How much more basic can you get than squishing the fears that stop you like a crunchy cockroach? And empower you with the knowledge to get started. But even if you're not new to fermenting, I have a ton of juicy nuggets for you to enjoy. Let's geek out over fermentation. First things first, the mac daddy of them all, botulism. And why it's literally impossible for you to get it from fermented veggies. Fun fact, did you know that the word botulism comes from the Latin word for sausage? You're about to find out why. I went to the CDC website and looked up every case of botulism in the United States from 2001 to 2018, which is the entire time frame of it being available on their website. And according to these graphs and my ability to add, which is suspect at best, that's a lot of lines, there were a total of 339 cases, 26 unknown cases, 21 from home cooking, two from deer antler tea, one from infused garlic oil, 10 from gas station nacho cheese, nine from hot dog chili sauce, not related to nacho cheese, 37 from prison hooch, which I've learned is actually called pruno, 16 cases from chili at one event in 2001, 14 from commercially processed foods, and a whopping 102 from meat products, almost exclusively from various fermented Alaskan Inuit foods like stink head, stink fish, stink eggs, Eskimo salad with whale oil, seal blubber, seal oil, waged ale, aged whale and beaver tail. And the final two categories hit a little closer to home. 95 from home canned foods, 27 of which were at a church potluck from home canned potatoes, and seven were from fermented foods, but hang on. Six of those were from various bean ferments, which are not veggies, and one was from something labeled homemade kimchi, but it did not say whether it was fermented, canned, or pickled, and based on the ingredients in traditional kimchi, it was most likely contaminated from the shrimp or the fish sauce. So what can we take from that? Don't drink the hooch in prison or weird smelling seafood in Alaska. Don't have to tell me twice. Throw away the baked potato that's been sitting on your counter for three days, and don't eat gas station hot hold sauces. Be sure you know the person who made the potato salad at your potluck, and for heaven's sake, follow proper canning guidelines provided to you for free by the National Center for Home Food Preservation. But the main takeaway? Fermenting is statistically the safest way you can consume veggies. I'm telling you, it's just fear mongering. And I'm going to share with you five things that make death by fermenting virtually impossible. I'm obviously being dramatic, but it's true. A lot of people are apprehensive and I had all those same fears before I got started. I want to make sure you walk away from this video knowing very well why fermented foods are the safest foods you can consume. Botulism is not a real thing you should actively fear. It exists for sure, but you can't get it by accident through proper food preparation. Stats don't lie, but statisticians do. Stats don't lie, but statisticians do. According to Sandra Katz on page 19 and backed up by his 29-page bibliography, given recent large disease outbreaks traced to bacterial contamination of raw vegetables, typically from fecal runoff from factory farms, it might be fair to say that fermented foods are safer than raw foods. In a ferment, even in the case of contamination of the raw ingredients, the contaminating bacteria would have to struggle for survival in the presence of a stable community of acidifying bacteria specially adapted to the specific rich nutritive environment and secreting acids and other protective compounds. In this environment, Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, Clostridium, and other foodborne pathogens cannot survive. Over my years of digging into fermented foods, I have read many tales of people who have used fermented foods to help them fight their foodborne illnesses. But because I'm me, I didn't think to save them, so I can't accurately cite them in this video. Proper lacto-fermented vegetables have eliminated all pathogenic bacteria within the jar, so why wouldn't it do the same thing in your body? It probably does, but people who profit off your illness probably don't want you to know that. This is the first video in our second second annual month-long collaboration I'm hosting called Fermented February, and I'm being joined by 22 other inspiring creators. The lovely Amy over at Magnolia Pines Homestead has joined us since I made the collaboration announcement video, so make sure you go ring her bell too. Each day in the month of February, one of us will bring you a fermenting video on whatever they are inspired to make. If you want to keep up with us, screenshot this in three, two, 
One, bookmark the playlist link below so you can easily find all of the videos taking part in the official Fermented February collaboration. I'll be updating it daily. The best way you can spread the fermenting fun is to share our videos on all your social media. If you feel inspired to make a video, a post, a reel, a TikTok, or whatever creative outlet you have, be sure to use the hashtag FermentedFebruary2023. The logo is only for those in the collab, but be sure to share the heck out of that hashtag. And bonus points if you shout out this collab. Don't be shy now. I'll be sharing a few of the ones that I find particularly inspiring from the hashtag as the month moves along. Now, every video that you watch in the official collab and leave a comment on is an entry to win a ton of weekly prizes as well as the grand finale giveaways on March 1st. And the lovely Sheila over at Haas Tools has offered to help sponsor a lot of the giveaway prizes. I'll tell you all about those later. She'll also be fermenting a very highly requested video, so make sure you stay tuned for that on Valentine's Day. We have channels that are gonna be making kimchi, syrup, sourdough, fermenting with dehydrated ingredients, various kraut recipes, limes, wine, tempeh, goat cheese, berries, beans, creating a scoby, sodas, koji ferments, and so much more. So after you finish this video, check the description box below for the channel list so you can subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you check to see that your subscription sticks because YouTube can be a fickle beast. But if you're just finding my channel, you don't have to wait till the end to subscribe. It's right there, so make sure you click it for a good time. When you create a ferment, you're making an environment that the good bacteria will love and thrive in, but for the nasty ones, it's more like the wicked witch jumped in a pool. According to this fermenting hero of mine, fermentation is the transformation of foods by very various bacteria, fungi, and the enzymes they produce. People harness this transformative power in order to produce alcohol, preserve food, and make it more delicious, less toxic, and more delicious. If you're new to fermenting, you need this book. Sandor Katz is one of the OGs for bringing back fermentation and making it cool again. Reading this book will educate and inspire you while introducing you to a whole new world. If you don't got it, get it. I'll put a link for it down below. I'm gonna be giving away two copies of this book. One of them is gonna be this coming Monday at 7 p.m. Central on my live stream, and the other one's gonna be on March 1st in the grand finale. So make sure you comment on all the videos to be entered to win. To create a safe environment inside of a ferment, we need three conditions. Salty, airless, and acidic. You take care of the first two, but the third one happens on its own. Thing one, salt. Salt is what makes a controlled fermentation possible. The bacteria we are trying to culture enjoys a moderately salty environment, giving them the opportunity to rapidly multiply and take over the jar before the bad guys can catch up. Salt basically turns the jar into the pit of despair for the pathogenic bacteria. It's what makes the jar safe. It's what makes what makes it's what makes it's what makes it it's what makes it's what makes it's what makes the jar safe until the good guys can multiply. Gosh dang it. It's what makes it's what makes it's what makes the jar safe until the good guys get strong enough to dominate it on their own. Make sense? It's almost as important as the bacteria itself. If you're salt phobic or you need to avoid it for some reason, you can use half the amount of salt by adding a starter culture. But I don't recommend it for most fermentations, so I'm not gonna talk about it here today. I gotta cut somewhere. It seems like there's as many types of salt as there are varieties of ferments. Rock salt, fine salt, sea salt, bay salt, Celtic salt, Baja salt, salt from the Himalayan mountains, or from a prehistoric cave in Utah. People are gonna say that you need this or avoid that, microplastics, iodine, and radiation, oh my! And I do agree with that for my own kitchen. I encourage you to use the best salt that you're comfortable with, but don't stress about it too much. But I do recommend a bare minimum of avoiding regular iodized table salt. Iodine is antimicrobial, so when we're trying to culture bacteria, we don't want to throw in one more thing that it has to overcome. We want Easy Street, like Fezzik clearing the Castle Gate, not Amigo Montoya trying to revive the mostly dead Wesley. I'm mentioning salt first because when you're beginning fermentation, I really encourage you to weigh all of your ingredients and the salt to get more consistent and predictable results. And it's easier to weigh your ingredients before you chop it up. Too much salt and it's gonna taste nasty, plus only a select number of bacteria will survive and it's not really the ones that we're going for. But too little salt, your veggies are gonna be nasty and mushy and they will be very at risk for contamination. There's a range, but about two to 2.5% is standard. And all you gotta do, is weigh your veggies in grams. And this is 1389. So all we're gonna do is move the decimal place over two, which gives us 13.9, and double that. So really it's like 28 grams. It's math so easy, I'm even willing to do it on camera. I wanna welcome you to the Fermented Homestead. If we haven't met before, hey, my name is Anna, and I bring you along for my gut healing shenanigans as we preserve food and learn the skills we weren't lucky enough to have passed down to us. If you're having a good time, maybe think about hitting that thumbs up button. It really helps us a lot and helps other channels find us too. Thing two. Fresh veggies. Well, really, it's what's on the vegetables that we can't even see. And the more fresher the veggies, the more teeming it is with an epic amount of these bacteria. When most people think of bacteria, they head to the closest hand sanitizer station and lather up with some lemon-scented poison. But when you're fermenting, you need to learn to embrace that bacteria. We have to culture it. Love it like Elvira loves your cats, but nicer. Like Archie loves Veronica, 
or Betty, depending on the week. But be consistent like the true love of Buttercup and Wesley. Get the point? Learn to love it. And I'm talking about the good ones, not the Count Rugans. Put the antibacterial everything in the trash and let the good guys go Anigo Montoya on them. The first thing we need to do is remove the outer leaf in as intact piece as possible. Good luck. But it is helpful to cut down the spine and separate it from the core. It peels back a little easier from that direction. And just set it aside. Then cut off the end. Then we'll quarter it and cut out the cores. You can see here the cores have a lot of fiber to them and it has the most prebiotic fiber, which is fantastic food for our fermenting bacteria. But if you cut them up the same size as the leaves, it can be pretty unappealing and fibrous. So I minced these bits up smaller than a lingerie model's lunch, but cut it up in whatever size floats your boat. For the leaves, I used to love nice thick slices like this, but I recently switched to thinner ones like these. With most ferments, size totally matters because the more surface that's exposed, the more sugar is available, so it will ferment quicker, which is not usually a good thing in vegetable fermenting. But I find that since the cabbage leaves are so thin already, it really doesn't make a noticeable difference. By now you might be wondering why your bacteria is so important and what exactly does it do in our ferment. The good bacteria use the sugars and the fibers in our food and use it as fuel to reproduce. Their main byproduct is lactic acid, and that is the main player in the preservation of this tasty treat. The bacteria are also amazing for our bodies, and they do so many incredible things in our poop shoot and beyond. But that's not within the scope of this video. But my girl Heather, who happens to be an insanely knowledgeable and hilarious functional nutritionist, is going to be obsessing over all the health benefits for us in her video on the 13th. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Now we're going to add the salt. Just kind of sprinkle it on. And we're just gonna spend a minute or two kind of squeezing it and massaging it. Too many jokes and not a single one is appropriate for all ages, so I'll just leave that one there. Just to keep it simple, the bacteria create everything it needs to preserve this food. And then the bacteria preserve us once we consume it. Makes sense? Some people like to trade arm day and just beat the stuffing out of this for like 10 minutes. Not me. All we're trying to do here is to get the salt a little bit penetrated through the skin of our veggies so that it can start to draw the moisture out. I just set this aside, covered in a tea towel for like one to four hours, kind of just depending on my schedule and my mood. This method is easier and just as effective as a good old fashioned beat down, but I like the finished product better. It's gonna be nice and crunchy. On to thing three. Time. These incredibly microscopic acid poopers need time to do their magic. Real food can often take a few turns around the clock, but I promise it's oh so worth it. Fermenting creates a deep, complex umami flavor that is unable to be duplicated any other way. There are three main stages in your fermentation that you can easily keep track of with your eyeballs. The first stage is from the moment we added the salt, and now is when a special set of oxygen-loving bacteria feast on all there is left in these veggies, so we're left with an airless environment. If you remember, that is one of the three conditions that are required to have a healthy ferment. I'm using this pickle packer to make sure that we are packing in our veggies super tight because we don't want to have any air pockets inside this kraut jar. Well, that, that is unfortunate. We just lost a great deal of our brine, so can you even believe how much brine is produced just from the salt sucking it out of the vegetables? Make sure you're leaving at least an inch and a half of headspace. This needs room to grow, but more on that in just a sec. For us to help create an airless environment, we need, we need to make sure that we're getting all of these little bits underneath the brine level. And to do that, we're gonna use that outer leaf that we set aside earlier. We're gonna use the canning ring to trace a nice circle then put it in the jar and tuck it down on the edges. Don't be shy, use a few layers, okay? And you wanna to top it off with the spine piece here. This will keep all the little bits under the brine and keep them from becoming floating mold magnets. Then we're gonna use this handy dandy pickle puck to hold everything underneath the brine because eventually it will want to float. Once the stage one bacteria die off, they leave behind all their good works, but make way for the next guys in stage two, usually around the three to five day mark. Leucana stock bacteria take center stage and you can tell they've arrived by all the bubbles. This stage is especially rewarding and reassuring for newer fermenters because it's really visually obvious that the fermentation process is on the right track. And the color will also start to change, so don't fret when that happens. These bacteria produce many byproducts, but the main one that you're gonna see is carbon dioxide. That's why you wanna leave the extra headspace in there, otherwise you're gonna lose a lot of your tasty brine right out the top. Lit or not, it'll find a way. During this stage, you're gonna want to burp your jars. And all that means is you're just going to open it, 
let the air out, close it. You can avoid this step entirely by using these pickle pipes from Mason Tops. There's also a variety of other lids that you can try, but I find this one is readily available and super beginner friendly. It's my favorite, so I feel comfortable recommending it. This little X on top lets the pressure out but blocks the mold and air from getting back in. Another handy benefit of using this kit when making kraut is you can just press down the weight to get the CO2 pockets out and get your headspace back. But this kit will also be in the final giveaway of fermented February provided by our sponsors over at Haas Tools. They provided an entire kit, plus a set of pickle pipes, pickle packer, gift cards, and an heirloom seed collection. Haas Tools is a small family owned gardening company that I came across in 2021. Growing their seeds, I found that they had the highest germination rate and very hardy plants. I hope you'll consider heading down to the link below and check out their amazing seeds, gardening tools for hobby gardeners and market farmers alike. They even have a selection of preservation equipment. Back to the ferment. In stage two, you'll start to see the brine get cloudy, totally normal. It's yet another sign that your ferment is fabulous. This stage also produces several other acids that help lower the pH enough to bring in stage three of the fermentation and starts around seven to 14 days. You can see this start to happen when the bubbles have pretty much stopped. Remember, just because the bubbles stop, it doesn't mean the ferment is done. Unless you want it to be, but the benefits continue to multiply, so I beg you to let it keep going. Here's where the main player in preservation takes over, lactobacillus. These guys create only one byproduct, lactic acid. That's where it gets the name lacto-fermentation. It doesn't have lactose in it. It's not a milk product. It comes from lactic acid, which quickly drops the pH, getting it into a safe range for the third condition needed for safe fermentation. Just for a brief explanation, the pH scale runs from zero to 14. Zero is the most acidic metal melting acid there is. And the range goes all the way up to 14, which is completely alkaline. Seven is neutral, meaning it is neither acidic nor alkaline. And there's a whole wide range between those two numbers. This stage is often where a white sediment is going to start to show up on the tops of your veggies. That's just the cloudy brine settling in. Don't worry about it. To store this ferment, we're going to leave it at a kind of a cooler room temperature between 65 to 68. That's ideal in my opinion. But you can go as high as 75 and still get pretty good results. If the temperature is too hot, you're gonna get limp veggies. They will ferment too quickly and not develop as deep of a flavor and they're more likely to go bad in your fridge. If it's too cold to a certain degree, it's just gonna take longer for the veggies to ferment. It'll develop a deeper flavor and will last longer in long-term preservation in your fridge. We're gonna wanna put this in a dish of some sort to collect any spills that might happen. Keep it with other ferments that are similar, but at least eight feet away from other ferments, especially ones with a SCOBY. They can share bacteria and yeast and lead to an off flavor and possible contamination of your SCOBY. Thing four, know how to check it. As the ferment moves through the steps, you'll want to check on top to see how it's doing. First, you'll want to keep your eye on the top to see if you have any floaters. You want to catch them early for best results. You can do this by popping the lid and just looking on the inside. You'll want to use a clean spoon if you need to grab anything off of it. When you think it might be done, clean hands, just remove the weight and set it aside on a clean plate. Pull your cabbage wrap back just a little bit, just enough, don't, don't take it off. Grab a little bit from the inside and then taste it. This one's definitely not ready and I knew it wouldn't be. Make sure that you never ever double dip your utensils if you touch it with your mouth. That introduces a whole new set of problems. Since we set this on our clean plate, we can just put it right back inside of our ferment and wrap it back up so it can continue its fermentation. There is no point in the fermentation process where tasting is not okay. It's never bad to try. You won't get sick on any clean ferment. But to avoid contaminating the jar, I recommend doing this as few times as possible. Your ferment is done when it tastes how you like, but might I suggest you wait at least three weeks. This is when the lactic acid will be strong enough to fully flavor it and preserve it. Dashing an unfinished ferment in the fridge will leave it with little protections against the outside world. I love a nice umami rich ferment, so I let mine go for a long time, like a lot of months. But to do this, you need to make sure it's in a cooler area. One way that you can help ease beginner's anxiety is with these pH test strips. You might be wondering, how is this gonna help ease your mind? Remember that lactic acid we talked about? It lowers the pH, and the more that's produced, the lower the pH level. That low pH means nasties, including botulism, E. coli, salmonella, listeria, can't survive and they melt like the wicked witch and she brings her flying monkeys with her. So you can have peace of mind that your ferment is safe for you and your family to consume. Should I have started this video months ago so that we could have a finished kraut that we could accurately test? 
Well, yeah, but I'm gonna be real. I struggle with time management, but I do have a couple of other ferments we can use to check. You're aiming for under 4.6 pH. This one goes down to 4.4. So if the color changes, we're good. There you go. Looks like we're sitting, this one is about 3.6. One side note I want to include on consuming fermented foods. When you're new, your gut is not conditioned to consume these powerful foods. Take it slow, maybe like a tablespoon at a time. Or you could have what feels like a bad reaction called a Herxheimer reaction. That happens when you consume too much of a fermented food and the bacteria in there are gonna go all Inigo Montoya on your insides to get your gut cleaned up. Too many of them can really stir up some trouble inside your poop chute. So just remember to take it easy and increase your consumption slowly, maybe over a couple of weeks, your gut pheromones will thank you. Thing five, know when to chuck it. But don't click off right away just because you got all the things. There's a lot to it. I'm gonna need the fermenting police to cover their ears here. Not all mold is grounds to toss it. If you see a tiny white fuzz growing, I will almost always just scoop it off plus a little bit more around it. That usually just means that you had a floater in there and the or the brine dropped. Somehow mold found it, fell in love, and made babies. If you have a sensitivity to mold, be smart about it and know what your personal limits are. In order to catch it early, you need to check it often without risking contaminating the jars. I know it can be a tough rope to walk in the beginning, but you'll totally get it, I promise. If it gets out of control or grows any other color, it's an instant hard pass for me. Something went wrong and I don't care to find out what it was. I dumped that in a compost quicker than Prince Humpernick in a sword fight. Some will think this is terrible and how dare I scrape it off. One mold means it's all colonized. And that's fine, you do you boo. I've seen others with vats of sauerkraut covered in an inch thick layer of mold and they just peel it back like a lid, grab it out and then replace it. I don't know which is correct, but the line that I've drawn, I've always had good results. And you need to find your own comfort level. You'll also occasionally see something called Calm yeast. It looks like a white wrinkly film on top and sometimes it can have an oily sheen to it. Many newer fermenters mistake this for mold, but it's not, and it's not dangerous, but in higher quantities, it can have an off-putting taste. Just scoop it off with a clean spoon. This usually happens in sweeter ferments like fruit, beets and carrots, or if the temperature is too hot. It means your ferment is going too quickly, so hit the brakes and put that stuff in a different spot. Salt, fresh veggies, thyme, know how to check it, and know when to chuck it. If you're left wanting more, you can check out this video to learn all sorts of geeky stuff to further heal your gut and better tolerate fermented foods. Peace out, sauerkraut.